Hey, thanks for tuning in again. This is Thought Rock. My name is Dave Hensman. I'm here with my good friend, Mike Satterfield. Last time we were together, we were talking about time and we rolled uh, out of, we ran out of time. <laughs> and so we thought we'd pick up another episode and do time part D. Anyway, so we're uh, looking at time and we thought today we would kind of, we looked at, you know, the metaphysical part of it. We looked at some other things about time last time, but today we thought we'd kind of bring it into what the scriptures say about time, mm. uh, because that's always a great uh, study, uh, not only in history, but into, into our current time, into our present day. And uh, scripture is always relevant, and it's always so, it, it always is so layered, and it's so meaningful, and it's so mysterious, and it's so deep that it's always worth uh, looking at. So even if you're uh, new to the scriptures, you're new to kind of thinking about things from a biblical perspective, I think you'll find this episode interesting. Mike, what do you think about that? The Bible and time. Yeah, there's a lot to say. I, you know, even in the, the prep before we start the recording, I'm just overwhelmed that we could talk about this element or this facet or this yes. thing. Just, there's a lot to say about this. And then on the other hand, there's a lot that we don't know as well. For, for as much as there is to say about time, right? as it as it occurs in the scriptures and is referred to there's so much that we just don't understand right on this side of heaven so yeah it's a really it's a really enigmatic thing yep it is so where do we want to start on this uh, little journey today well i think we we talked a good bit last time about the the concept of transcendence it would be worth just maybe touching on that quickly again sure. yeah that god is by nature outside of the domain of time he is not bound by time. It's a construct that he has created and in which we are we have been placed. Right. So um, I, people get really torqued up and torqued out in their thinking about this issue because our experience with time is such that we have difficulty conceptualizing what I just described. Right. It's hard to think about a being who's not constrained by time like it, we are. It is. It is. And so, so when we talk about God's omniscience and his foreknowledge, if God is outside of the domain of time, and we think of time linearly, it's not really a, a difficult next step to talk about God's omniscience and knowing everything if he's outside of that construct and can see every moment and be simultaneously, and this will just curl somebody's toes, be simultaneously in every moment fully i don't and we just can't even like even expressing that we can't even begin to express how that works yeah well i mean we're 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 coming to the table as finite beings and we're trying to unwrap elements of the infinite yeah and so when we think of an infinite god you know i mean we can our our minds can only take us so far in that journey to this in this reality yeah uh, but the same is true when you look up into the night sky. You know, space goes on. Right. And it doesn't stop. And even if it did stop, there's something beyond it. You know, there's something, every boundary, there's every wall, there's something behind the wall. Right. And so no matter how far you take, you know, space, it, there, it, it's an infinite property. It's an infinite concept. And so I think that, because I used to, you know, I, play, I remember I had this room when I was a kid and my, uh, I was banished to the back side of the garage because I was learning the <laughs> learning the bass guitar. So dad built a room at the back of the garage. That's where I spent most of the year and uh, pounding out songs on the bass. But it had a slanted kind of roof window thing. And I could sit in my, like lay in my bed at night and I could look up. I had an amazing view of the night sky. Mm. And I would often lay in my bed as a teenager, look it up and I'm thinking, that universe goes on forever. And you try and think of forever till your brain starts to you right. know, bleed. And um, and then you would think about the infiniteness of God, right? And then how He lives in this realm of other. And you know, sometimes people talk about ho what is holiness, and <laughs> yeah. well, holiness is other. You know, God yeah. is completely other. So everything we experience and look at from our finite world, yeah. God is other. Yeah. And yet, in that otherness, in that vastness, in that in, in that eternal, infinite right. being that He is, He is still ever present in the moments that we live. And He, He, he says in the Scripture, "I he, I walk with you." 
Yeah. And that that kind of pops your cork a little bit. You go, yeah. you walk with me, but you also walk with 7 billion other people if they choose to walk with you. <laughs> yeah. Simultaneously at the same time, and you never sleep or slumber, and you never have to take a vacation because you're tired. Right. Like, that's an amazing concept. And people say, well, that's just crazy. Is it? Right. Is it? Let's look at that. Right. Well, that's a beautiful segue to, uh, I was just thinking this morning again about Psalm 139. Uh, you know, I'm in, we're involved with uh, the Church of Planned Parenthood and sure, sure. Um, trying to, you know, gather Christians to pray and intercede on behalf of the unborn. And uh, in that context, I've preached there on the corner in Everett. And uh, Psalm 139 is such a great passage dealing with the unborn. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that God says about the unborn is before even one of them came to pass, I knew every one of your days. Right. And so it's not God experiencing our, just experiencing our lives moment by moment on that linear timeline. He is simultaneously at every moment. And then not just my life or your right. life or both, but every human being on the planet. Right. He's, he's in every moment. It's, he's, he's present, fully present. Mm -hmm. And that is just mind blowing. Absolutely, it is. Yeah, he, he's, and this, this, in, the, I, I think the thing that stretches us so many times with God is, is understanding the infiniteness, and yet the deep personal side of it yes. simultaneously. Because you think, well, how can he be so vast and yet so personal? Right. How can he be? How can he be so out there and yet so in? Yeah. Right. It's like that is the. Those are the biblical questions that you look at and you go, yeah. this is why God is so amazing. This is why the concept of who he is and, right. and who he has revealed himself to be right. is also so amazing. Yeah. And the comfort I take in that is that, so what that means from a practical perspective for you know my seeking college friends who might be watching that are trying to figure all this out, is that you are never alone. You have your creator, the one who knew of you before you existed, the one who planned your days, the one who knows your life, is personally interested in the days that you live on this earth right. and the days that you're going to live afterward and where you're going to live those yeah. days. So that's yeah. a God who's not just a, a cosmic great force or a cosmic great being. Yeah. That's a personal creator yes. that truly does function and act and live as a personal father, a good yeah. father, yeah, you know, who desires to be intimately involved with every one of his creation, right? And so, I know a lot of people have twisted relationships <laughs> with the concept of father. Sure, some some sure. people have been abandoned by the father, some people have been abused by a father, others of us have had incredible, great role models as fathers. And I know there's a massive spectrum out there uh, on the concept of father, but when you understand God. As the perfect father, which yeah. is who he is, directly and intimately in, engaged in every moment of my life and every problem and every circumstance and every joy and every success. Yeah. He's your cheering section. He's your supply line of intellect. He is your ability to function. He is in him we move and breathe and have our being. Right. He's the source of who we are. Yeah. So it's there's so much going on yeah. in his presence and in his being and how that relates to us in the finite days that we live. It'd be a fun podcast to talk about fathers for one or two weeks. There's this, the scene of Jesus' baptism speaks exactly to what you're talking about. Right. And that the father is disclosing some things in that moment. Uh, as Jesus comes up out of the water, there's the Father giving His approval. Right. Uh, he's He's present. Yes. Uh, he, he's He's affirming His His Son in that yeah. moment. There's about five or six elements there that, man, I just uh, I love getting men together from men's retreat and saying, Hey guys, this is what it looks like to right. come alongside your kids, to come alongside your wife, and yeah. Um, but but what a cool scene yeah. to to unpack that. Theme, yeah. that, that idea. I remember sitting, hearing an old, he was an old professor one time, and he was talking about um, the way we need to be as role models like God. So the same, the same, um, 
the same way God functions mm. is the pattern of how we should function. Right. Right. And he is that ideal. He is that he is the one who we look to. He is the one that he is the ultimate model that we should follow. Yeah. And he and he made this statement, which I thought was very very powerful. He said, as fathers, we're there to nurture, we're there to equip, we're there to celebrate. Everything that our, our kids are doing, we want to move them in this in this direction where they can be all that God's made them to be. He said, right. because fathers do not castorate their sons. Right. And that was a great, like, that's kind of a graphic thing. He said, but as a father, you want your son to go and be all that he can be and reproduce himself into what God has yeah. for him. Right? Yeah. And that's that's a big part of that father picture. Yeah. In this whole concept of time. Well, so... How many how many times you know as have we as dads or our dads or other dads uh, instead of coming alongside that kid in that moment that son and encouraging so no 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 stop you know just cut him off don't do that way no 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 don't do that right you think about that you know with an infinite God who foreknows all things the opportunity is there for God to constantly be interjecting so stop, sure. no 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 stop stop right constantly. Constantly, he has opportunities because he's infinite, and he, right. And yet, when I think about Psalm 139 again, it's like before a word is even spoken, before it's even on your tongue, I know it completely. Right. But I don't always stop you from saying it. Right. I, right. So there's a, there's a will, there's a component of the will here for humanity, but 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 the restraint of God in allowing us creaturely freedom like that, that's pretty phenomenal too. Well, it's it's amazing because when I when I think about that in in the context of how you share it, and I and I think it's it it's it's worth it's worth reading some of this because uh, it is so relevant to the concept of time. So, and I was trying to look up. Uh, yeah, here we go. So I'm just going to do that again. There it is. So he says here in Psalm 139, he he goes, God, you have examined my heart, mm -hmm. and you know everything about me. Yeah. So God knows everything about me, my inner workings, my motives, uh, my future, my past, everything. He knows it. Okay. Yeah. He says, you know, when I sit down, you know, when I'm stand, when I'm going to stand up, you know, my thoughts, even when I'm far away. Now, here's an interesting thing. There, there are many of us who have spent time far away from God. Yes. Yeah. And that far away concept is only a perspective on what we think. Mm. We're never actually far away from God right. because the furthest, and I've, I've always loved this, the furthest you can ever be away from God <laughs> is him outside your door knocking on your heart. Right. That's where he's, if he's not within, in a relationship with you, he's outside knocking on yeah. the door. Yeah. So God has never been that far away. But we have this perception, oh, I'm far away from God. And, and yeah, you can be, you know, dismissive. You can ignore. Yeah. You can emotionally be distant. You can... You've, but you've separated yourself. Right. God hasn't pushed you away. God's actually wanting you to come and be in a relationship. Yeah. So even from our perspective, when we think we're so far away, <laughs> yeah. you know, right. God's going, yeah, but I'm still here knocking. Right. right. You see me when I travel. You see me when I rest at home. You know everything that I do. Yeah. And and that's an amazing concept. And and so then he goes, but be but you go before me. Now check this out. Yeah. You go before me, mm -hmm. so I'm here. He goes before me, and he follows me. Yeah. How does that happen? Yeah. Simultaneously. Outside of the time continuum, right. Right. God is seeing my life as it's progressing. <coughs> he's gone into my future, but he's also coming up the rear, making sure everything's okay behind me. Yeah. That's 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 massive. That's incredible. And there's there's a security in that. There's a there's a. There's a confidence you can have if you enter into a relationship with God from the concept of knowing him, the relation as he wants to be known through his son Christ, through his son Jesus, mm -hmm. then you're going to enter into a relationship where you are very aware of the God of your yesterday, the God of your today, and the God of your tomorrow. That's right. He's constantly moving that along with you. Yeah. And so... Some of us think back of our yesterday. Oh man, that yesterday I totally screwed up. Yeah, guess yeah, but I've taken care of that. You know, you you, you ask for forgiveness, or right. you put that radio. I've, that's 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 leave that with me. Well, Lord, what about my today? Well, today 
Sufficient is the grace for today. I've got grace for today. I've got knowledge for today. I've got everything you need for today. And tomorrow, well, don't worry about tomorrow because I'm already at tomorrow. Right. You know, I, I wrote a I wrote a lyric. <laughs> I wrote a lyric one time um, <coughs> because sometimes people will come to a moment in their life and they think, well, my life is over. Yeah. You know, or they'll have someone say, well, you're a loser and you'll never recover or you'll never you'll never get over this. Yeah. Right. And, and I wrote this lyric in the song, and it says, you know, some say, some say, some say that your life is over, but I'm best friends with tomorrow, mm. and tomorrow is a brand new day. And that's God. God is best friends with tomorrow. Yeah. Indeed. God is tomorrow. Yeah. And you've got a new start tomorrow. That's right. You've got a new start right now if that's you want. Right. So. Yeah. Well, it's, I'm just sitting here pondering everything that you've just unpacked, and then we'll have to do a podcast on the incarnation at some point, because... Here, God enters into human form. He takes right. on flesh and he self-limits and, and puts you know parameters on himself while here on earth in, right. in the incarnation. And I, it just, I'm thinking about Jeannie, you know, Robin Williams and phenomenal cosmic powers, <laughs> itty bitty living space, right? right it's like, right, yeah. that's, that's exactly what he did to himself. He right. limited himself. Yeah. To experience life as a fully human being and to die for our sins and, and atone for our sins that we yeah, might it's, have. It's life. amazing. I mean, and that 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 reality is is so it's such a you're right, we need to unpack that in another podcast, but it's such a grand reality when you think of eternal God, yeah, outside of time and space, now becoming like his creation. And living within the very domain he created for his creation. Yeah. So he lays aside and limits. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it is crazy. It really is crazy. I remember trying to, you know, just in a microcosmic way when the kids were small, trying to, you know, help them with a puzzle or help them with right. Legos. Like the, the impulse to do it for them and, and, and yes. get it done faster. It's like right. this is taking forever I'm, I, I'm generally not a patient person really? when it comes to that <laughs> surprise um, if you really want to know the truth ask my wife but but to think of God doing that yeah and and for for every person in some capacity um, not yeah. just in the incarnation but but coming alongside every person that mm -hmm. he's ever made and offering to be with them and offering to walk beside them and and to have the patience that he has and long suffering that he has. Well, I think that that's one of the things that I don't think we fully understand. We talk a lot about oh, God's long suffering, but we really have no idea what that means. Sure. Because, you know, we know how frustrated we can get driving through 10 minutes of rush hour traffic. Which or, I, I did you know, today. you just did that. But you know, we know how frustrated <laughs> we can get, you know, like you said, trying to show somebody something. Yeah. Especially when they don't get it. That's it. And yet, God, through Christ, that's exactly what Jesus did. Yes. In fact, there there are a few tells in the Gospels when he, because as a as Jesus comes for that three and a bit years that he's walking with his disciples and he's teaching them and he's showing them and he's coming alongside them. There's a few times he says, "How long am I going to have to do this with you guys?" Yeah, like because they don't get a lot of the stuff that Jesus is trying to teach, and yet he you can see Jesus. You know, patiently teaching, but still going. You guys really need to get this, right? You know, and yet, yet in in a in an incredible way, God is is like that with us. You need to get this, but I'm walking with you till you do. Well, and this is the beauty of an infinite God taking on human flesh. I I only know patience and perseverance to my breaking point. Right. I only know patience until I have I have no more patience. Right. And and as I get older, I have more patience. But yeah. Uh, but it's not an infinite amount of patience. No, it's not. And right. here is God, uh, not only imposing a self limitation on Himself, but He's experiencing what we experience, and and I'm sure experiencing frustration. But he, he vocalizes at times of his own disciples. Right. Do you guys still don't understand what I'm trying to tell you? Right. And yet he perseveres yes. in his patience. Far, there's no breaking point. There's no 
Well, even with sin, there's no point of sin, right? Yeah. And even Jesus, he endures the cross again. That's another example yeah. of the endurance through time of what he did, so that we could be saved and redeemed. Yeah. That's a that's an amazing concept too. Absolutely. So we see this infinite God outside of the realm of time inserts himself into time. Um, it, and especially specifically in the person of Jesus, yeah. and then methodically walks moment by moment, day by day, with the, with his disciples and with others, moving them to that place where where they can really experience him in, in, in fullness. Yeah, and then Jesus even says, and by the way, and when I go, when I go back to the Father, I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit. Yeah. So he can continue the journey with you. Yeah. So even though, you know, God lives outside of time, Jesus in his resurrection, he, of course, he ascends to be with the Father. And now he's also in outside of the time dimension. Now he sends his Holy Spirit to stay, to stay within, again, that time continuum, yeah. working with us on a daily basis. Yeah. Man, that's massive. Yeah. Uh, and then the only difference really is instead of God alongside us, now we have God in, in us. In us. And that's that's a huge advantage. People don't realize, you know, we, we kind of look at the church age, oh, it would be better if Jesus was still alive. And, and, and I tell people, like, would we all go to the same church? I mean, would we all right. try to go to wherever Jesus' church was? Right. Like, no, there'd be no other pastors. That's right. There, there'd just be one what? place where everybody's trying to cram into the building, right? Right. Um, so he and even Jesus says it's better for you that I go away. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's amazing. There's right. something really beautiful about that that we don't fully. Well, it's interesting because because again, outside of you know, it's better it's better for us mm -hmm. that Jesus returned outside of the dimension of time. Right. So he could then be in that place where he sees all, knows mm -hmm. all. I mean, he did know all, all on earth, but where he's outside of that time dimension again. Yeah. And now his spirit is able to move among us all. Upon us all, yeah, because Jesus was limited in that humanity portion, right? And that He was in one place at one time, yeah, right. So it's better for us that Jesus is now outside of that again, yeah, right. He can he's 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 no longer limited by the human property, like you said earlier, right. that He voluntarily put Himself in at during the incarnation. So He's eternal again now. I right. mean, he always was eternal, but he, He's right. in His resurrected form. Yeah, He's He's no longer limited to the to the borders. That self-imposed limitation is right. now gone. Exactly. Yes. It's Absolutely. incredible. Okay. It's nuts. So let's talk a little bit about when the scriptures talk about the the fullness of time. Go, mm. You know, Galatians, because we, we've talked a little bit about, you know, we as human <laughs> beings tend to be a little bit impatient. And so we, we see this concept come up a little bit in scripture. And, and it's it kind of refers to this thing about the fullness of time, and and that's kind of a, a weird. It's kind of a weird little term. The fullness of time. What does that? What does that, oh, what does that mean? Um, so the idea of the fullness of time is uh, one of the elements of it. Anyway, is to, at just the optimal moment, at just the right time, Jesus came into the world. It took the form of a human being, put on flesh, if you will, and lived among us. He tabernacled, John says. He actually right. uses the word tabernacle. Yeah, he does. That's a great, great phrase. Um, and so he dwelt among us. He lived with us. And this idea that the fullness of time, that, that in God's economy, there was an optimal moment in history. In, in the progression, that linear progression of human history, there is a moment that is optimized for this to happen, right. and it wasn't um, in the days of Elijah, no, nope. or or back to in the days of Noah, and it and it's not in the days of President Biden, no, it wasn't it, in the was, days of Churchill, it wasn't in the right. days of your, you know, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so in the fullness of time speaks directly to this idea that God's God's plan had a had an optimal moment, and it was enacted and unfolded exactly the way that God wanted it to at exactly the right moment related to that. And, and, and we keep saying, I keep saying things that 
we're gonna have to do other podcasts on. <laughs> Related to that, I'm having this discussion. Is a growth is a growth uh, industry. This podcast, <laughs> we're going to be busy a long time. <laughs> right. Well, um, I keep having these conversations with uh, people that are uh, they're watching the chosen or they're watching sure. other uh, Jesus rich. Sure. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and about the second commandment. Right. Right. Um, the second commandment is not to make not just graven images, but any any images related to our worship of God and right. worship of Jesus. And, and then so we get into these conversations about Jesus coloring pages for the kids. And, uh, you know, so all these conversations about all this stuff. Right. But one of the beautiful things, so I, I, I I'm really have been wrestling with the second sure. commandment lately. Right. And its application. And as I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking, what a beautiful um, act on the part of God to send Jesus into the world at a moment when the word would spread all across the known world because of what Rome had put in place in terms of infrastructure. Right. And what, um, I mean, now that now Greek, you know, Koine Greeks, the, the trade language yes, of the was. known empire. Yeah. So the, so the word is going to spread the way that words do, uh, both written and, yeah. and oral. And, but there's nobody taking pictures of Jesus. Right. Because yeah. if they had, we'd have, a bazillion. Of, uh, well, we already do, but well, but yeah, it'd be worse. We'd have a bazillion like Christian cults where if you right. don't have Jesus' hairstyle, right, you're not a true follower of Jesus. If you don't wear the sandals Jesus wore, right, you're not a true follower. We're just so prone to that kind of stupidity. Well, because anytime man loses consciousness of the presence of God, yes, he tries to manufacture, yeah. A, a, a image to yeah. make him feel religious yeah. or to make him feel connected. And I think there is a difference between, you know, telling the story in creative ways. I, I again, I, I don't, I'm probably not as hard and fast as some would be on, on some of that. But at the same time, I see the, you know, I mean, here, here's an argument, for instance, like, in in the time in times when people couldn't read, yeah, pictures were a teaching tool. I mean, some of the carved relief taught the Bible stories. Sure. So so, you know, and I so a teaching, a teaching tool that's visual, mm-hmm. um, you know, I don't think is necessarily a graven image, right. right? But at the same time, what we tend to do. And we've seen this all throughout church history, is we take the teaching tool yes. and then we turn it into an icon, where yeah. it becomes we sanctif- we we elevate it into something now that is either idolatrous yeah. or problematic, right. right? And a lot of it comes back to this whole thing about you know God has called us into a relationship, and that relationship is both intellectual and experiential right and if we lose either of those yes then we look for forms that's it right yeah. and so a form of religion can be three songs and offering in a sermon a form of religion can be going to mass twice a week right a form can be you know the way i say the baptism you know is it i baptize you in Jesus' name and the Father's and the I, is it the right words all you know like yeah, it's, it, you know yeah. it's like we can we can make idols and stuff out of anything oh yeah right and so but when we lose consciousness of God's presence then we drift yep. so that's one part of the problem yes the other part is there's there are when we reject God then we want to create gods of our own and yes. that's a different animal. Right. That's that's pure unadulterated idolatry, yeah. where we're now creating, you know, and, and God, I love how He mocks this, and He says, you know, oh, you're you're gods who have eyes but cannot see, and arms that cannot move, and you know, you take one piece of wood and you 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 know, you put it in the fire and you make supper, and the other guy you make an idol, and the other you build, it, you know, right. like it's just so asinine what we do yeah. with idolatry, yeah, you know. Well, that's Psalm one thirty five, but but here's well, there's a, there's another piece to that though. He, he goes on because he describes them and he just lays a smack down on them. It's like you, you carved this thing out of stone yes. or wood or whatever and you use some of it to to have a fire and some right. of it to worship. And it's like, but then he says, in, in, I think it's Psalm 135 and Psalm 115. I, I'll have to get the references. But 
uh, in both Psalms where he says almost verbatim the same thing. He says, and those who worship them become like, like them. them. So there's this axiomatic truth embedded in our reality that whatever we worship, we become like. So you worship the living, you become alive. Right. If you worship the dead, you become dead. Yes. And that's a very true thing. Yes. I mean, that's, that's, that is, that's the gospel right there. Amen. You know, he is the living God. Right. And so in this time continuum of the fullness of time, and the thing that, coming back to that fullness of time, you know, we always say time is everything. Yeah. Right? And, and so when I look at the concept of the fullness of time, God did have those sweet spots chosen for specific purposes. Mm -hmm. And I think along with that, because we're by nature fairly impatient, mm -hmm. one of the things that I think we need to learn from how God works with time is we need to allow ourselves to submit to God's timing. Yes. Because so often we'll get impatient with God and want to run ahead yeah. or we want to do our own thing or God doesn't show up on our schedule. And when you go back through scripture, you look at Abraham, you look at Moses, you look at Noah is a classic example too. Right. Of all of these people who between the power, between the promise and the power or the promise and the performance of, of the promise, there were massive time delays in between those things. Yes. And I was saying just recently that, you know, your faith is not perfected in the light. Your faith is perfected in the fog and in the darkness of the night. Right. It's when you don't see what God's doing and you believe. Right. That's where your faith is perfected. Yes. And so sometimes in our desire, we want everything now clear and we want to understand everything. We want to know what's going on. Yeah. Our, that's, that doesn't help our faith. No. But, but so God's timing, this fullness of time thing. Right. You know, he has a time, even in our infinite timeline of our life, where he's going to do certain things, and that's different for everyone. Sure. But to patiently wait on the Lord for what he has for you yeah. is a great discipline to learn. You're not running off doing your own thing. You're right. not running off going here, going there, going everywhere. You're saying, Lord, show me. Yeah. Open the door at the right time. Yeah. I, 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 can, I can sit here and do nothing, Lord, if that's what you want me to do. Yeah. Those who wait on you will never be put to shame. They'll never be put to shame. Yeah. But those who run off and head, head and do their own thing, I've seen the devastation that that can cause. Well, that's Isaiah, I want to say 50, Isaiah 50, 10 and 11. Let him who walks in darkness, let him trust in the name of the Lord as God. But you who would light your own fires, you want to figure it out for yourself and try to make your own way. God says, this is what you shall receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Right. So... There, there's an element here. God calls us, even though we don't understand all this, we don't know the mechanics of how it all works. Trust me, he says. Trust right. me in the midst of this. You can't see what's ahead of you. You're living in a moment-by-moment -moment reality in a linear timeline in this construct. And that's why you need to trust me because I'm outside of it. I can see everything. I am everywhere. I'm at every moment. Mm. If you'll trust me, I will lead you through this. And that's why Matthew ten twenty six talks about that everything will be revealed in its in its right time. Yeah. Jesus talks about that. Yeah. And I think what happens sometimes in our own lives is we're impatient for something to happen or for something to take place. We run ahead or we push and we shove and or we're trying to dig around things that maybe aren't disclosed. And and God's saying, Listen, I will I will make it all clear at the right time. Yeah. There were times in my life where if I had known certain details and certain facts, mm -hmm. it would have destroyed me. Sure. It would have immobilized me. Right. But because I didn't know some things, I was able to keep going in the journey that God had for me. Right. And it was only until later I saw some of the things that I was dealing with and some of the things I avoided thanks to God's providence and God's watching my rear rear right. guard and my, and my future at the same time. Right. So... You don't necessarily want to know everything all the time. You want That's to right. trust that God is leading you and God is guiding you as he sees fit for your particular journey in your life. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Let's go to Luke 4, 5. Here, here's something that I want to pick at your brain on. Luke okay. 4, 5. It's talking about the devil and uh, not one of our favorite characters, <laughs> but... Uh, 
important to talk about nonetheless. Um, so it says in Luke 4, 5, the devil took Jesus up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Mm. So we know the story. It was where Jesus was being tempted of the devil. He's out. He fasted for 40 days. And, and, and the devil is tempting him. Uh, he's trying to um, basically cause Jesus to sin is what he's trying to do. Right. He's trying to actually thwart the redemptive plan of God yes. by turning Jesus against the Father and against the purpose of which he had come to accomplish. Yeah. So we've got this story, this little picture, and it's it's worth kind of unpacking. Um, so it starts off in Luke... Uh, well, well, in fact, you know, it starts a little bit before that if we want to get into the... the Jesus returns, of course, from, from the wilderness, and he's tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all the time and became very hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell the stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus said, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Right. So he rebukes the devil. Yeah. And even though he's hungry, and I'm sure he would have loved to have sat down to some matzah or some focaccia <laughs> bread or some pizza or whatever sure. kind of bread he wanted to eat. Um, Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Then the devil. So how does Jesus combat the devil in that moment? Yeah, it's always the authority of the word of God. Bingo. Every time. He quotes some scripture. Yeah, every time. And and that's a very powerful lesson for us. Because mm -hmm. we're not called to reason with the devil. No. We're not even called to argue with the devil. We're just called to basically let the word of God deal with the that's devil. That's right. And I like that. Yeah. Um, I don't, I heard, I was in a prayer meeting one time. I was hearing some people pray and, and this guy said, devil, you need to listen to me. And I thought to myself, you moron. Yeah. The devil's not going to listen to you. No. Who, who do you think you are? Right. You know, now I know he was, you know, he probably meant well. But the fact of the matter is, you know, Michael contended the Lord rebuke you. Right. Like even heaven's armies go out in the name of the Lord. We yeah. don't, there's no power in my prayers other than the power of Jesus. Yeah. Right. Even though it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, it's still it's still not the power of my prayer. Right. It's the power of Christ that's doing this combat. Yeah. So Jesus, even Jesus, quotes the word of God to Satan. Yeah. That's all he yeah. says. Well, man shouldn't live by bread alone. Next question. Right. Phenomenal. Yeah. So then the devil takes him up and and he reveals to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he says to Jesus, I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them. The devil said, because they are mine to give anyone I please. Mm -hmm. What does he mean by that? Well, this goes back to the fall of man. And the vice regency of, of creation was given to humanity. It was given right. to Adam, who is our head. And in the fall in Genesis 3, um, that think of it as a title deed to a piece of property. Right. And that, that title deed was transferred to Satan because Adam brought himself under the authority, authority of Satan. And, and so this is why scripture calls our, our planet, uh, or excuse me, calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. Right. Or the, the God of this world. Right. And those are titles that, that the New Testament uses for Satan because he holds the title deed, which, just to put a nice cherry on the top, Revelation chapter 5. Yes, it does. When So John's there and the angel's with him and, and John, and they said, nobody... We can't find anybody who can open the scroll that has the seven seals within right. and without. There's nobody worthy to open it, and, yeah. and everybody's weeping. John's weeping, and the angel says, don't, don't weep. Right. The Son, right? Jesus, the, the, mm -hmm. the living Word, the Messiah, He is able. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals right. because He's the one who purchased that back yes. with His own blood. Right. And so that's the scene in heaven where, where it, it goes back to, to Ruth. The days of Ruth and, and the kinsman redeemer. Right. That's the role that Jesus plays in redeeming not not only the bride, the Gentile bride. Yeah. It's a great yeah, play that's in, right. in the book of Ruth. Yeah. But um, it, redeeming the property too. Right. And so he, he's, he's bought back the, the title deed to the earth with his own blood. Right. So this is a beautiful scene in Revelation 5. It just kind of it's the, the culmination of all these storylines. Right. And the so, the, so the reason we live today in such a messed up world is because the dominion that man had and man thinks he's running the world see no, this is yeah, the thing yeah. man thinks puppets. you know yeah we're they're puppets of the demonic agenda it goes yeah. right back to 
Nimrod and the government system of Babel. It goes right yep. back to that that world Babylonian world system yep. that Satan runs and operates his little minions through. And so we we look around and we go, you know, why do we always butt up against bad government? Well, because <laughs> because it's like government human governance, human government right now is run under the auspices of Satan's authority. Right. And and that's why when you look at all governments of the world are like this. Yeah. And so people say, well, this party and that party, you can get all political about it. But no matter, it, it, the whole world is under this, yeah. this authority. And so Jesus is taken up and, and Satan shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Right. So Satan himself is living outside of our present time continuum. He's, he's, in, he's in this, this power, this, he's a prince in power in the air in this atmosphere of right. that's outside of our 24 hour time clock mm -hmm. and that's where he lives as well he says to Jesus, he makes this great great you know thing well this is what i'm going to do this is what i can this yeah. is what i can give you yeah and it just doesn't work no no okay we got to keep going because we that's got uh, we got a little bit more to do before we uh, shut this one <laughs> off <laughs> okay so um Luke twenty one twenty talks about a time of destruction coming, and I, I I want us to look at that kind of as the last thing I had. As you probably got some more stuff you want to talk about too, so so let's just mm -hmm. hit it. But um, nope, let me just do this over here. I kind of I should have this called up earlier, but so Luke, uh, I had Luke twenty one, and I just blew it. <laughs> Typing too fast. Okay, here we go. So we, we go down to this, this verse, and Jesus said, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that the time of its destruction has arrived. Yeah. So Jesus prophetically speaks to his disciples, and he prophetically speaks to us, that this normative life, this, this um, linear timeline, is going to have a season where destruction is going to enter in. And it's not going to be like anything the world's ever seen before. It's not going to right. be like World War One or World War Two. It's not going to be like, you know, Vietnam or Korea or any of those kind of skirmishes or the French Revolution or any of those mm -hmm. historical things. This is something other. It's a cosmic destruction battle between Satan's agenda to hold on to that deed that you were talking yeah. about yep. and Jesus reclaiming the rightful ownership. Yeah. And that's going to be a showdown that is going to be out of this world. Right. There's a there's an element here, I think probably for the sake of our watchers and listeners um, in in this section of scripture there's a there's a relatively parallel passage in Matthew's gospel. Um, one of the elements of prophecy that probably many people might not be aware of is that sometimes there's a near and a far application. Right. And so Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, Jesus quotes it, it right after the temptation. He comes in to the synagogue on the Sabbath. They hand him the scroll of Isaiah right. and he reads Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, but he never finishes verse 2 because it wasn't the day of the wrath of the Lord. Right, that's right. There's, there's a pause in that verse. Yes, there is. Um, and so what you get is um, a lot of passages where there's a near application and then there's a far application. And the image I use here in Western Washington is like if you were up at our property on the ridge, you could you can see Mount Pilchuck. And then if you could just align it a little bit better yeah. between you and Mount Rainier, Pilchuck would obscure Yes. Mount Rainier. Right. You would you would you wouldn't be able to differentiate That's and right. you just seeing what you think is one mountain. But Pilchuck in the foreground is about four thousand feet in elevation. Yeah. Mount Rainier is fourteen thousand feet in elevation. It is further away. Yes. And so there's some of these things like that. The optics That's a are great a little illustration. confusing, right? Yeah. yeah. So there's it, this passage has something like that in that there was an application of this that happened. In that generation, in Jesus, in that, the generation right. of those disciples, yep. in, in 70 AD, Titus yep. Vespasian and the Roman yep. legions came in. They and sacked Jerusalem. They yep. sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, desecrated the temple, uh, tore the temple mount com complex down, the stones. They were after all the gold inlay. Yep. Um, didn't leave one stone upon another. Which Jesus, Jesus 
exactly what he said. Yeah. Uh, but there is also a future application of this reality that has right. yet to occur. Right. Which points us to a rebuilt temple at some point. Which, which always, as we we often said, you know, Scripture is layered. Yes. On so many levels, from a historical narrative to a prophetic, you know, mm-hmm. there's a practical application, yeah. spiritual applications, and there's so many different levels of how Scripture uh, has has so many different. Not, I, I don't want to use the word meanings, but it's just it's it's woven. It's a fabric yeah. woven with so much interconnection. Yeah. And so. Yeah, there, there's a historical past prophecy that's already been fulfilled, but a future one that's coming. And I love that illustration of the of the two mountains. You know, you, it's all about perspective where you're standing. The yes. foreground, if you're in front of it, you don't see the background, but right. you lift your perspective and you see it very clearly. Right. And that's exactly what's going on there. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Wow. So time. This this whole thing about what God has to say about time. Uh, our time is precious. Yeah. Our time is finite, and we don't have unlimited time. So we right. need to be cognizant, mm. I think, of our days. In fact, I think the scripture clearly says we need to redeem the time. We yeah. need to spend it wisely. Right. And you know, for that student, and I keep referring to that student out there that's trying to figure out all this stuff about, you know, where he's at in, in his place in the world. Um, I would encourage young people watching, don't waste your time. Mm. Um, you know, I thought I had all the time in the world when I was 20. Yeah. And then I realized, wow, you know, I, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's great. You know, and all of a sudden you're 30 and, and then I was married at 30, you know, in my thirties mm-hmm. kids, the decades go fast. Yes. And so don't, don't move yourself into a place where you're not cognizant of the preciousness of time. Right. And start to seek God and seek an understanding of your time within his time. Yeah. Line up your time with what God is wanting to do in you and through you. Yes. Um, find it out. Figure it out. It's discoverable. Ask him. Ask him. Read his word. <laughs> study his word. Get into a place where you're with like-minded people in good churches that teach the Bible that yeah. will help you discover who you are in God, who you can be in Christ. Yes. And pursue your day's wealth um, because we don't have an infinite amount of them in this present life. Right. Now, we are. there is a time coming after this life right. where we're going to have infinite time. That's mind-blowing. It's mind-boggling. Yes. And we're going to spend that time either with God in his presence and in his future uh, creation, yes, heaven and earth, or we're going to spend that time away from him, separated because of the choice we've, we make in this life. With the, with the days we have now, we're making choices, yes. either to walk with God and know God or to separate ourselves mm-hmm. and forever, to separate ourselves forever from yes. him. And I would encourage and I would strongly suggest you build a relationship with God because it's the best relationship you'll ever have. Yeah. But, you know, if you don't want God, he'll give you what you want. He's the ultimate respecter of persons. He is the ultimate respecter of persons. He's not prejudiced. No. Nope. He'll, he'll, he'd love to have you in the, on the team, but he's not going to force you to play. That's right. Yeah. Mm. That's good stuff. Well, that is it for this one. That was a good episode. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yourself. <laughs> Try not to. No. Self No, it is a good. I mean, it, you know, because and time is a big topic, and I know we could go on and on about more, but we have some other things we want to talk about too. I but know. hopefully, that scratched the surface for you a little bit about time and how it works. And thanks for spending this time right. with us here. This is Thought Rock. We're at the beginning of a thought revolution. Mike Satterfield and Dave Hensman. We're glad you tuned in today, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.